Okay, everyone fairly comfortable, we're a little bit cramped, yeah? Everyone fairly okay? Good, okay, well, uh, we'll get started then. So, welcome to the Department of STS, Science and Technology Studies here at UCL. Uh, my name is Karina Fernley, I'm the Undergraduate Admissions Tutor. Uh, you may have already uh, met me either over lunch or just now showing our books. So, um, ooh, I shall stand over here. Um, so, what I want to do is just to give you a little overview of our department and um, what we do and who we are, and then afterwards we're going to have uh, three taster lectures, so it gives you a little bit of a feel uh, for, for what uh, what we do and what we get up to. So can I just, first of all, before we start, can I get hands up for those of you who are interested in the History and Philosophy of Science degree? Okay, fantastic. And hands up for those who are interested in the Science and Society course. Excellent. Okay, so nearly 50-50, that's brilliant. So, um, first of all, I wanted to start off with who we are. Uh, as a department, we were founded in 1921, so we're quite an old department and we are an interdisciplinary centre. So uh, we really integrate all the different aspects of science, humanities, arts um, together uh, to really look at robust um, issues that we see in science and technology studies. We are of course located in the heart of London, which I'll come back to, which is uh, a really great position for us to be in. We're award winning for our teaching and research and we do lots and lots of public engagement events. In fact, I'm doing my first uh, science show off this evening, which uh, should hopefully be a good fun. It's where you stand up for nine minutes and you try and uh, put some comedy into your research, so we'll see how that goes. Um, we are rated as outstanding by our own students. We have around 19 members of staff, eight research fellows, teaching fellows. We have our uh, professional services uh, team who support us in what we do, which is actually fantastic. We have over 40 MSc students and we have around 35 PhD students. So we're really quite a big department in terms of our community of staff and, and, and students. So why are we different? We are actually unique in the UK in that we bring the science and society and history and philosophy of science together in one department. That's quite unique. And what that means is that when you're taking one of those two courses, it exposes you to elements of the other disciplines, which really makes you a more well-rounded student when you come out and you can really see how to put your science into practice or you can understand perhaps more the philosophical, um, historical aspects of your, your own work. Now, we are absolutely passionate about sharing our research. So here's some of the books that um, are published. So we've got Causality by uh, Phyllis here. We've got the author here. Then we've got... Brian, do we have? Yeah, we've got Brian. Here we have Brian. And Andy Gregory, who will be with us in shortly, uh, a book there. So you can see we're very active in terms of uh, publishing and trying to uh, get our research out there. But we don't just do it in the traditional academic ways. We do it in all sorts of different ways. We like to get out to schools, engage with local communities, work with artists, um, do all sorts of weird kind of public engagement activities as well that we really enjoy doing. So what we do, what makes us different in a way, is that we really want to critically engage with, analyse and reflect what's happening in science and technology studies. And ultimately, our department is kind of all about curiosity. We're really interested in the world around us. We are generally led by our own research. So we want our staff to teach modules that they're really excited about. And that means keeping them fresh. We don't want to be just teaching stuff for the sake of it. If someone's doing a new project or they found something or they want to do something a little bit more quirky, they will then explore that and create a new module out of it. And that means that you guys get a weird and wonderful module that might be really interesting. Um, and it means that the staff are really passionate about what they're doing because it's relevant and engaging to them. So that's what we like to keep it fresh, we like to keep cutting edge and update what we do. And primarily, we're here to ask questions. We want to ask questions about what's going on in the world. So I'm going to give you a few examples of the kinds of things that we might look at in science and technology studies. <clears throat> so the first question is, does science improve our health? So does anyone have any idea about what this photo might be relating to? It was a news story about a year and a half ago. So about a year and a half ago, there was the news that the NHS was actually going to start trialling uterus transplants for those that who, who do not have a uterus or are not able to have children 
may have the potential to have a uterus transplant and have a child. And this was actually done in Denmark, and um, so they're trialling at the moment. As I understand it, babies are currently being baked, so we don't know quite what the outcome is going to be. But what a wonderful thing, right? The ability to transplant a uterus may mean that a couple who have infertility problems may be able to have their own child. What a wonderful gift science can be, in that sense, to have a family. But then we can ask questions about, well, does science always improve our health? Does anyone recognise what this deformity is and what the cause of it was? Yes? Was that from thalidomide? It was from thalidomide. So, around the 1950s, I think it was, there was a, a doctor in Australia who was looking at thalidomide, which was a sort of a sleeping uh, a drill, a, a, a medication to help you relax, which was very popular in the United States, especially with the 60s and the 70s booming. And um, it was found that actually this medication stopped sickness feeling. So this doctor in Australia decided to uh, prescribe this to the women who came to his clinic saying that they suffered from very, very poor uh, morning sickness, and he thought that this would help. Now, unfortunately, what happened nine months later was that children started to be born with these deformities where you have like um, a, a sort of sh small flipper-like arm, as you can see here. And around 50% of children actually died from uh, the impacts of thalidomide. So it was used off license. And unfortunately, what we saw was the consequence of using this drug. Now, in America, they actually decided not to use it and prescribe it in that context. So they never had any issues there. The uh, FDA were actually kind of held up as a, as a shining light, as being exemplary, but of course uh, hindsight is a great thing. So we can think about, does science improve our health? Sometimes we have all really good intentions, and then sometimes there are unknown consequences that come from it, which we saw in this case. And then the final thing, does science improve our health? So we all know that smoking increases our chances of lung cancer, we know that 80% of uh, cancer comes from smoking. All sorts of different and horrible diseases can result from smoking, yet people still choose to do it. And it's, the question is, people know, they know the, the risks involved, but people still choose to do it. So why is that? Those are some of the questions that we have to, we have to deal with and grapple with. Now, I want to talk, uh, give you some examples about natural hazards. So my specialism is actually natural hazards. I'm I'm very into volcanoes and disasters. So I'm going to use the natural hazard world to show some examples of questions that we might ask from events that have happened. So in 2004, there was the Boxing Day tsunami that happened in Sumatra in Indonesia. Now, 260,000 people died from this event. Why was that? Does anyone know why all those people died from this tsunami? because no one told them about it. There was no early warning system in place. So had all the scientists monitoring all the earthquakes and they could see that the tsunami might have been potentially generated, there's actually no way of communicating that to the public. So without that knowledge, how could the public respond? And then you might think, well, that's simple. We'll just put an early warning system in place, right? But it's not, because what happens is if you get a warning, but you don't know what to do with that warning, why is that, how is that useful? You know, you need to know where to go, what you're going to do in response to that. So it's also about communicating about what you do, given certain information. So this is one of the reasons why it's really important that we communicate our science so that we can prevent disasters like this from happening. Now, this is a picture of uh, the most deadliest force on the face of the planet, this pyroclastic flow. And this is Mount Pinatubo in 1991, Philippines, the second largest eruption last century. Now, the problem with this material is that it's about a thousand degrees Celsius. Um, if you get caught up in it, um, you will uh, basically be asphyxiated or burnt to death. It happens so quickly, we're not quite sure which happens first. So, and this travels at about the speed of a jet plane, about 450 miles per hour. So, if you're a scientist and you're trying to monitor what's going on at a, a volcano, you need to tell the people who live by the volcano to move from the volcano before this happens, because by the time this happens, it's too late. You've only got a few seconds before it's going to engulf the local communities around it. So this raises questions as how can we predict the unknown? How can we say when that volcano is going to erupt? 
and therefore we have to take more precautionary approaches, which is complicated because we're asking people to leave their home, leave their businesses, on the off chance that this volcano may erupt. So all sorts of difficulties there when we're looking at the unknown. Now some of you may remember this event. Can anyone pronounce the Icelandic volcano? Anyone? Anyone have a go? No? Oh. I'm waiting for the day that someone who's Icelandic can. Yes. Very good. I affected your clip. So very good. That's the best ever I've heard in a long time. So well done. Absolutely. 2010, this volcano, this tiny volcanic eruption, actually it was very, very small um, and relatively short, caused absolute chaos everywhere. Some of you may have been caught out in airplanes, or air, uh, in airports around the world. Some people were stuck in some very nice places and were very happy about that for an extra week's holiday. But what is interesting about this event was that a lot of the policies were around the fact that if there's volcanic ash in the air, the aviation, the planes will not fly because they suck in the ash and the ash gets melted in the jet engines and it chokes the engine. So very, very uh, dangerous thing for planes to, to fly in. So the policy was, if we don't fly through ash, then we don't have these problems. We don't have any damage to the engine, and we don't risk loss of life. Of course, after around six days of closure in Europe, the travel industry were getting rather upset about what was going on. And of course, arguably, what happened was that business pressures, pressures from the travel agencies, from cargo companies, all sorts of businesses, changed the policy so that they made it safe for aviation to fly through certain concentrations of, of ash. So we can see here that the science was missing, but that wasn't what changed the policy here. It was actually the pressure, the business pressures. And finally, questions we ask a lot in science and technology studies is about who do we listen to? Who is the expert? So this is Marjoram, who is the gatekeeper of the volcano Merapi in Indonesia. And he and his ancestor line is thought to be the person who will tell the local community about when the volcano is going to erupt. He will have a vision saying when the volcano is going to erupt. And unfortunately uh, for him, he got caught out in 2010 where he was killed by the volcanic eruption. And even more tragically, 13 other people were killed because they were trying to convince him to leave the volcano when it actually erupted. So the thing is, you know, a lot of people listened to him and were very um, sceptical about leaving despite the scientists' knowledge and, 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 and you know, predictions about what would happen. Uh, and so we have to think carefully about this person's role in the community and how they're you know, upheld within the community and work together to, to, to make sure that our expertise is shared and that everyone's values are counting so that we can come to really good decisions. So those are some of the kinds of questions that we look at when we're looking at science and technology studies. And of course, we've got our, our two degree schemes here. And you, you know all the entrance requirements. Um, and what I want to do just is to highlight a little bit about history and philosophy of science of our department. And we were actually the first university department in the UK to actually set out teaching in this field of history and philosophy of science. And of course, we still to this day have very strong links with the Royal Institution. And we look at various historical figures, such as Caroline Herschel here, who was one of the pioneering women in the very early days looking at astronomy. Then we also have our science and society, and this focuses much more on science policy, the public understanding of science, public engagement, and science communication. So it tends to be a little bit more contemporary, but we can also look historically as well at these issues. So what would your, what would your degree at STS look like? Well, in the first year, we like you to have a common first year. So it depends, doesn't matter which degree scheme you're doing, you'll do the same modules. And the idea is that it gives you a real foundation to build on in terms of your degree. So everyone learns the same materials. And these are some of the modules that we do in the first year. So essentially, you'll do a little bit of philosophy, a little bit of history, a bit of science communication, a bit of science policy, and so on. And that will really bring you together. And the really nice thing about you all doing the same modules is that you're all in the class together and you get to know one another as well. So you're not sort of splitting up. You become, there, there becomes a nice bonding uh, aspect to your first year and you get to know one another. In your second year, you actually get a lot more choice about what you want to do. So you pick uh, eight uh, further modules. Some are compulsory and then you have a certain set of choices. So one of them, for example, is uh, a module on public engagement that I was actually telling the parents about 
uh, which was one of the reasons um, that I was late this morning, is because my, uh, my module on public engagement is actually looking at Wellcome Trust this year. But last year what we did was we looked at the Cosmonaut exhibition, the Science Museum. Did anyone see this exhibition? It's absolutely well done, Phyllis. Excellent, well done. This is absolutely brilliant. There's another really exciting exhibition coming up on Valentina Teshnikova soon, who was the first female in space as well. So keep your eyes peeled for that, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. And what we were looking at was how these objects that were exhibited in Cosmonauts were how we could engage the public with these objects. And actually, this exhibition was really novel because it used volunteers to try and mediate between the object itself, which you may just look at and read at, read about, but a volunteer would come up and tell you a story about this particular object and try and bring it into life and bring that context into, into the object. So it was a really uh, revolutionary kind of style of museum exhibition and way of, uh, for the Science Museum reaching out to, to the, the broader public. So other options that you might choose in the second year include policy issues, public culture, religion, STS and practice, uh, philosophy of science, science and ethics. And indeed, um, in our final year, you then have much more choice in terms of six modules that you pick. And uh, at the end, you have a major research project. So you can see here in the final year, the modules start to get a little bit more esoteric, they might seem a little bit more intriguing. And the idea is to build again on your foundation of all that you've learned and start to apply it in new and interesting ways. So we, you know, we have modules on sleep and dreaming, for example, that asks quite profound questions about consciousness, you know, and what does it mean when we dream? And what is our state of awake and things like that? Yes. Yes, this year our wonderful timetabling system actually put one of the lectures at 11 o'clock at night oh. um, by accident. <laughs> so. so literally sleeping and dreaming at 11 o'clock at night. Don't worry, we don't normally schedule lectures at It was rescheduled. <laughs> yeah, it was rescheduled. So, um, so lots of different um, options here, everything from something quite practical with science and film production to something more like science and art and philosophy, which I'll come back to in a minute. As part of your final year, you have to produce your dissertation. And this is your opportunity to do your own research project, your independent research project, and write this up as a dissertation, which is a really amazing opportunity for you to take real ownership of your work and also to explore whatever it is that interests you. And quite often our students will pick subjects that they then want to go on and work in. So I've got a student at the moment who's looking at superfood as their example, and they're hoping that this dissertation is helping them build networks and contacts up as they're interviewing uh, various people around the issue of superfoods, and hoping that that will then lead on to potential job opportunities and so on. So it's a really good uh, opportunity, uh, the research project, and we, we really love seeing the diversity of projects that you have as part of that. So. I mentioned the other third year module, Science, Art, Philosophy. This is Kiara here. And you may notice around the room there's a, couple, a, quite a lot of posters here. So this is a module that brings together art, philosophy and science to try and understand the relationship of how science has been looked at over centuries, particularly using art. And so these are actually some of the posters that are created by our students just this year um, that illustrate some of the relationships between uh, philosophy and our understanding and our construction of science. So do take a minute to have a look at those posters at the end. So some other examples of some major projects that you may do are here. So things like uh, looking at cancer charity campaigning, looking at nuclear energy, sustainability, you might be looking at how passages in the Quran and Hadith are related to reproduction and fetal development and so on, or historical, astronomical um, discoveries in the Greek world. So there's a huge range of projects. You, it really is up to you. There is no limit to your imagination the, the, of projects that you can do. Uh, unless, of course, they're very, very ethically challenging. That would be the, the one thing that we might put our foot down on. So where's our teaching environment? Where does our teaching happen? Well, our teaching happens in lecture theatres, as uh, seminar spaces, much like this room. We do have lots of group tutorials. We have lots of one-to-one -one sessions. We have supervisions that we have, with our, particularly with our dissertation students. You will have a particular supervisor who will work with you closely and guide you through that independent research project. We have a number of practical classes, we also do field trips, and of course you've got the general reading that you need to do, um, project work. Now what we pride ourselves in in STS 
is to not just make you do loads and loads of exams. What we want to do is actually give you a load of good skills that's going to make you very employable in the world out there. And so what we like to do is get you presenting, we like you to get you uh, uh, debating, writing reports, doing role play, um, doing posters, as you can see here, online blogs, as you may see from my computer going around. And so our learning happens in lots of different ways. So you're not just learning the subject, you're also learning skill sets as well, which is really, really important, important for, your, uh, for, your, for getting the job that you really want. And in terms of jobs, here's our stats really on our career. So we like to think of our department as, a, as providing a flexible future. And what we mean by that is that our students go on to do a wide range of careers. And essentially what that means is that the students tend to go on and do the things that they want to do. And we support them in, in getting to that, that, that place. But our top three areas of employment are research, education, media and communication. And this is actually followed by business development, social services, healthcare and finance. So we've got a long list of alumni here, some working at GlaxoSmithKline, some working at the Wellcome Trust, some working at BBC, international NGOs, banks, management consultancies, looking at health policies and so on. So it's really about us supporting you in terms of where you want to go. And that's, that's what we try and encourage you to do. We want you to have a job that you really enjoy and that you want to do every day. That's, we think that's a really important thing to do. So you have in your bags our new newsletter, departmental newsletter called Alchemy. And this outlines uh, more about what we do as a department. So it's got everything from undergraduate, masters, PhD staff, some of our key publications, our seminar series. And the idea is really to give you a flavour of of what we do and what is possible. So actually, we've got an article by Kate here, who you've already met, of course, and how she met uh, Sir David Attenborough as part of her, her work here in STS. So really, you know, the world is your oyster here. And, um, you know, anything can happen. It's quite extraordinary. Brilliant. So we're here to make it happen. So we have this very strong sense of community. We have uh, student societies. We have our seminar series where we invite scholars from all around the world. Um, to come and present their latest research and everybody is welcome from our department and even outside of our department. Because you guys share that common first year, you tend to get to know each other really well and you get tend to have like a close-knit community. And part of learning is not just learning from your lecturers or you know the environment around you, but it's also your peers, like learning from one another and sharing your knowledge and experience and skills. So it's really great that you get to know each other right from the start. Of course we have London on our doorstep and while that may seem a bit overwhelming to some, it's fantastic for us for STS because we've got all the museums, the Science Museum, the Natural History Museum, we've got our UCL museums such as the Grant Museum, we've got the BBC, we've got the new uh, Crick's Institute, we've got newspapers, journalism, media on our doorstep and of course we've got government. So we really try and make the most of being right at the heart of the UK, if not the world and incorporate that into our modules and expose you to all those different areas. So we're really, really keen on making the most of our location. Now this is some of our students who tend to be pretty satisfied. We've got 100% student satisfaction here. And here's some comments from our students, uh, you know, saying they generally enjoy it and I think the teaching is really good. But I'm sure you guys had a good opportunity to speak with, with Kate and James as well in terms of, of how they felt about their experience. So what I'd like to do is to encourage you to take a, a good look at our website. We've got loads of information up there. We're also now recording all our seminar series and guest lectures, um, and that's all coming up online as well. So there's a great resource there. So if you want to know more about what kinds of things we do, there's more there as well as uh, following us on Twitter, where we advertise all our many events. So, what I'd like to do is to now uh, move over to our, our taster lecturers. So first of all, we've got Andrew Gregory, we've got Phyllis, Ilari and Brian Barmer, and then Joe will be coming back to give you a little bit of a welcome. So, does anyone have any questions at this point? Anyone? No? You all okay? Not too hot, not too cold? No? Okay, great. Okay. So, we shall move on to Andy. That's okay. Oh. You have your, 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 